Hey guys, hope you're all doing well. Now for today's video, I wanted to discuss why Ian Malcolm is so important to Jurassic Park. And the answer to that question is, because he's right. Now before I go, okay, so there's a little more to it than that. In reality, Ian Malcolm offers quite possibly one of the most crucial viewpoints in the entire franchise. His unique background in chaos theory and mathematics gives us a very different perspective to that of the scientists Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler. He's also constantly at odds with the father of Jurassic Park himself, John Hammond. And it's that kind of interplay and interesting debate back and forth between all of these different people that really gives us the whole meaning of what the Jurassic Park story's themes are really all about. The kind and gentle old man simply wants to offer a theme park where kids can come and see the wonders that he's created for the world, more so than any small flea circus could ever give them. He's also overly ambitious and not exactly a master in self-control when it comes to making his mark on the planet. So of course, Ian Malcolm acts as a pretty interesting opposing figure to Hammond's always optimistic viewpoint. When you compare the characters of Hammond and Malcolm with one another, you get the real debate that takes place in the first story. Put aside the entire plot of Grant learning to love breeding and focus on the biggest champion of bringing back the dinosaurs, as well as that man's biggest critic, Hammond. A man dressed in all white has this kind of loving, grandfatherly nature about him. He loves to see his creations instill wonder and awe in the minds of kids and adults alike. He had the technology to do something truly extraordinary, and he did just that. Malcolm, on the other hand, couldn't be further away from that mentality. Instead of the sterile white getup of Hammond's attire, the Chaotician is only seen wearing nothing but black clothing. If we only look at the first film alone, we can see that he's constantly dogging Hammond about the massive amount of problems that Jurassic Park will eventually have to deal with. Creation may be an act of sheer will, John, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea to create just because you can, especially extinct life forms that we have no preceding experience with. And above all of that, the very notion that Hammond seeks to control these prehistoric animals is absolutely absolutely maddening to Ian Malcolm. Computer systems and genetic laboratories mean nothing to the behaviors of these prehistoric creatures. To make a certain point, I'd actually like to go back to the movie's source material before we go any further and look at our first introduction to the character of Ian Malcolm in Michael Crichton's novel, Jurassic Park. Shortly before midnight, he stepped on the plane at the Dallas airport, a tall, thin, balding man of 35, dressed entirely in black. Black shirt, black trousers, black socks, black sneakers. Ah, Dr. Malcolm, Hammond said, smiling with forced graciousness. Malcolm grinned. Hello, John. Yes, I'm afraid your old nemesis is here. Malcolm sat in one of the padded chairs. The stewardess asked him if he wanted a drink. He said Diet Coke, shaken, not stirred. Humid Dallas air drifted through the open door. Ellie asked him, isn't it a little warm for black? You're extremely pretty, Dr. Sattler, he said. I could look at your legs all day. But no, as a matter of fact, black is an excellent color for heat. If you remember your black body radiation, black is actually best in heat. Efficient radiation. In any case, I wear only two colors, black and gray. Ellie was staring at him, her mouth open. Dr. Malcolm, Hammond explained, is a man of strong opinions. And mad as a hatter, Malcolm said cheerfully. Now even though I'm paraphrasing, that's a pretty different introduction to what we got in the 1993 movie. But it still reaffirms the same kind of character that he is in both entities. Malcolm is the antithesis of Hammond. He calls himself, quite literally, John's old nemesis during this introduction. And it's their personal relationship with one another that turns the dinosaur theme park story into such an interesting philosophical debate. Another thing that makes Malcolm indescribably important to Jurassic Park is the fact that he's actually more than just a character that was written on a page. The author of the original books has gone on record to say that Malcolm is really a voice for he himself. So this guy is more than just a character that was created with a certain viewpoint. You see, Crichton uses Ian Malcolm in Jurassic Park in the Lost World as a kind of catalyst for his own personal opinions about our real world. This is why the Chaotician normally goes on long rants and speaks about a variety of complex scientific theories that relate back to the problems that Hammond was having while building Jurassic Park. Ideas like social behavior, complex systems, evolution, the foolishness in trying to do wild irrational things, just to further our own careers, all of that is a small dose of what he's infused into the literary character that he's written for these important books. Speaking of which, Malcolm isn't just important to the books and original movie. He's of course stuck around for further entries and provided a lot of much needed commentary for all of the carnage and chaos that goes on around him. 
The most interesting of which, in my opinion, is his role in the Lost World movie. Now, the reason that I find the second Jurassic Park film's protagonist so engaging and interesting is because the movie is really tailor-made for his character in every way it could be. The second island that was introduced in this movie is even named Isla Sorna, which is a clever subtextual meaning when translated as the Island of Sarcasm. In The Lost World, Malcolm is ironically forced to go to Site B to rescue his girlfriend, Sarah Harding. But unbeknownst to him, his estranged daughter has made it a point of stowing away on the trip to the island. She does this in an effort to get to spend more time with her father. You see, parenting is actually a pretty big theme in The Lost World, which is further fleshed out by the constant examples of dinosaurs trying to protect their infants that play out during the duration of this movie. But what I really want to talk about is the fact that, originally, Ian Malcolm was actually supposed to change in The Lost World Jurassic Park. He was actually going to have a completed character arc that would have shown him a certain understanding, and that is that he needs to be there for his daughter more. He needs to actually become what these primitive creatures are in terms of being a nurturing parent. While this was something that was all but lost in translation with the 97 movie, we can see the development play out clearly in David Kep's screenplay. There were actually some important integral scenes in that original script, and they were going to orchestrate the importance of understanding that Ian Malcolm is actually not always right. One of my favorite parts from that script that didn't make it into the movie is a conversation between Roland Timbo and the Chaotician during the Engine Hunter's trek towards the Operations Building. Roland was actually supposed to fall in stride with Malcolm instead of Van Owen, and the two were going to have a very different philosophical debate. Kelly would walk up a bit further from the two of them in order to give them some time to talk, but she'd still be in earshot of their conversation. After Roland asks Malcolm why he'd come to the island, Ian would say that he did it because it existed, and because people needed to learn that it existed. Roland points out to the Chaotician that even if people didn't know that it exists, it would still be here, even if they would go on not knowing. But Malcolm doesn't like this idea because the public will go on being in what he calls the absence of truth. The big game hunter asks Malcolm if he values truth over his own life, and the response from the man was actually quite interesting. Ian says that he doesn't care about his own life, but if he ever thought for a second that his daughter would be in danger, he wouldn't be able to handle it. This is when Roland was supposed to ask if Kelly is the one that Ian is talking about, and Malcolm replied with the following dialogue, I'm afraid so. I don't know what the hell I'm doing with kids. I never should have had her. Kelly would unfortunately hear her father say this and give the audience a sad look of disappointment. Now, Malcolm was supposed to ask Roland Timbo why he was on Isla Sorna, and Timbo gives his famous speech about taking down the T-Rex and proving to be the second greatest predator that's ever lived. This is what spurs a great deal of ranting from Malcolm, who goes on to say that Roland's motives are nothing but self-testing, or in Roland's case, self-destruction. But he goes on to say that maybe that's our function as human beings. Every few years, some animal comes along and kills off the rest of the world and lets evolution proceed to the next phase. Maybe we're all just supposed to destroy ourselves and every other thing around us. This particular speech is heard by every hunter in the entire group, and they all fall silent after hearing such a disturbing viewpoint of the world. Now, Roland Timbo was going to grab Ian Malcolm by the collar and growl a big warning in his ear. Tell you what, you can see whatever you want to but you will not spew any more nihilist rants at anyone else in this group. I'm fighting panic, and you push the wrong buttons. Understand? After that, Malcolm was going to learn that this conversation was officially over. As a lot of you probably know, much later in the movie, we were going to get the famous deleted scene of Kelly asking Ian to marry Sarah, a plea from the infant to her parent as a means of them finally living and growing together as a family. Not too dissimilar from the relationship that the baby T-Rex had with its own family. All of this was going to end with Malcolm and Kelly attending John Hammond's funeral, where some big decisions were going to be made. When the survivors of Isla Sorna would meet up with Lex and Tim, the heirs to Injun would tell the Chaotician that they think it's a good idea to reveal the dinosaurs to the press. But now, Malcolm was going to take Roland's advice and state that he doesn't think the public needs to learn about Site B at all telling all of them that the group standing there, sharing the world with each other right now in that very moment, was still something that was real, whether or not anyone else on Earth knew about their existence. And sometimes life itself might just be more valuable than the truth that Ian had ignorantly followed for so long. This was going to be a big point for Malcolm to talk about reality, and that even when you stop believing in it, it doesn't just go away. The film would end after Ian starts looking down at Kelly, and this would make her look up at him and smile. 
Now, of course, none of that really happens in the Lost World movie at all, and Ian Malcolm just kind of stays the same for the whole thing without any significant arc. But the fact that there was indeed one planned has always been really fascinating to me, because this would kind of force the man who we assumed was always right to be someone who was really just like all of the rest of us. He isn't some guy set on God mode that always has the proper answers for everyone and everything that's around him. And he's actually just as flawed as his old nemesis, Hammond, was after all. If you didn't know any of that information that I just went over before watching this video, I really don't think you should worry about why you didn't know or ask yourself why you didn't or whatever. The simple fact is that some of this stuff is just blatantly not talked about by people at all. I'm sure there are tons of individuals who have done in-depth reviews on Jurassic Park and the Lost World that don't even know about any of this stuff at all. We're getting into some super deep material that isn't really surface level whatsoever. So if this is all new to you, don't worry, it's totally understandable. Now, despite none of that script playing out in the second Jurassic movie, Malcolm again makes a pretty important case against bringing any of the dinosaurs to the mainland. He understands that it's not exactly something that would end up going very well for us humans. And of course, he's proven undoubtedly right in the end. Apart from the Lost World, Malcolm has also shown up in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, where he convinces the United States government not to intervene and relocate any of the dinosaurs that are in danger on Nublar. He does this by quoting a lot of Crichton in his testimony to the government, saying memorable stuff from the novel like, Change is like death. And while his role in Fallen Kingdom is considerably smaller than what was in the first two films, it's interestingly peppered into the movie the same way that his old nemesis, John Hammond, was put into the beginning and end of The Lost World. Where, remember, initially, Malcolm was supposed to show us that he needs to change. However, Malcolm goes uncontested in the courtroom scenes of Fallen Kingdom and kind of wins for the first time in the series' history. It turns out that the people are ready to listen to him. No one is going to come to the dinosaur's aid and relocate them anywhere at the start of the film. And that's all because Ian Malcolm told them that it was time for the animals to die. That being said, I think it's safe to say that Dr. Malcolm is an extremely valuable character for the overarching Jurassic Park franchise, and I can say so for more ways than just one. Now that we know he's supposed to come back for the final film in the Jurassic World trilogy, I'm extremely interested to see what the conversations will look like between himself, Owen, Claire, and most interestingly, Maisie. Ian is a man who acts as a constant warning to everyone around him who foolishly tries to control or tamper with Mother Nature. But even more importantly, Malcolm needs to be noted as just one viewpoint in the line of a great variety of different opinions. While John Hammond was most certainly in need of a reality check in the first movie, Malcolm was also supposed to get the same treatment by way of a sculling from Roland Timbo in The Lost World. The real reason Ian Malcolm is so important to Jurassic Park is because he's a man with a viewpoint that should never be ignored. The voice of logic, reason, and warning needs to be addressed and taken into account every time these stories unfold. That being said, he's most definitely not the only one that people need to listen to exclusively. Because while Malcolm can teach us about the unpredictability of complex systems, other characters serve as a means to teach us everything else that Jurassic Park has to offer. While Ian was right in stating that life would find a way and that it would be bad for people in the first film and novel, Crichton himself would tell Kelly not to listen to him at the end of the Lost World book. A monologue by fellow scientist Doc Thorne would end that second novel with a statement that completely disregards Malcolm's warnings, opinions, and theories that he believed in as nothing more than simple fantasies. At the end of the second book, Crichton would challenge the overtly cynical outlook Ian shared with his peers by going over the history of science and theories. If you have a copy of The Lost World, seriously, open it up and go over the last two pages. It's some really interesting stuff. Doc would tell Kelly that a hundred years ago, America believed in something called phlogiston. He asks her if she knew what that was. And no? Well, it doesn't matter, because it wasn't real anyway. He'd write that long ago, people believed in things that would never be real no matter how seriously people took them. And in the near future, people will look back on us in the present and laugh. Because by then, newer theories will be made up that they believe to be better just because they're new. They'll completely miss the point of life by going on about a countless number of things that have no bearing on their individual lives and what it means to be alive. Crichton would tell Kelly that the idea of human beings being a destructive force that would kill off the rest of the world and just act as a cog in the wheel of evolution was simply not something to take seriously. These ideas and theories are simply not real. In reality, they're just fantasies. Meanwhile, the sunlight that we all feel on our skin is real. 
and the salt that we can smell in the sea air is real too. The ending of The Lost World would give Malcolm quite the rebuttal by noting to us all that yes, life may find a way, but life is also wonderful. It's a gift to be alive. And at the end of the day, there isn't really anything else. Now I'm curious to hear what all of your opinions are on Ian Malcolm. He's the voice of Crichton, the voice of reason, and an important viewpoint that we should all listen to no matter what the hell we're trying to do in our lives. With that being said, how many of you have read through Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park and The Lost World? And how many of you have only seen the movies and nothing else? I'd love to hear what all of you guys think about Doc Thorne's final words at the end of the second novel, because they quite literally disregard Malcolm's rhetoric that was taken so seriously in all of the earlier material. I'd also like to know if any of you think that Malcolm's viewpoint might be challenged and that he might undergo some kind of change or have some sort of newfound understanding in the final movie in the series. Do you think this will happen? Or do you think they'll just keep him the way he is and use him as a dramatic commentator that continues to tell everyone that he was right? I personally think that's what they're going to do, but man, what a different evolution of the character would be to see something like that original Lost World script. Now whatever your own thoughts and opinions may be, I'd love to hear them in the comments down below. Now before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens, as well as all of my engine executives. I'd also like to thank all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. Guys, it really means the world to me that you all continue to support what I do, and I seriously am extremely thankful for everything that you guys do to help. Honestly, it means the world. Now I'd like to thank you all for watching this video, and hope that you all enjoy today's content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you'll consider subscribing if you're interested in hearing from me again. I'll see you all in the next video, guys. And as always, take it easy.